Hi everyone, this is Ben Marchman with NatureLink and I want to welcome you to the Firekeepers Global Conference in which we'll gather for powerful conversations with cutting edge experts and thought leaders who will guide you to connect to your truest self and activate your natural gifts. This event is designed to reinstate the importance of carrying our soul-directed vision back into our communities so that ourselves and our communities will flourish. Here you're invited to learn how to seek the guidance of your inner voice so that you can truly understand what it means to live life with purpose. I'm here with Rain Kasprenza, who is a midwife to, with the sacred human soul journey through the roles of transpersonal registered um, psychology. She's a soul-centric coach, a mentor, and a vision quest protector. She has served as a trainer, a lecturer for diplomas of transpersonal coaching and therapy. And through deep listening, attuning, and seeing the often unseen, her work invites individuals into a more intimate connection with their own depths in the mysterious world of soul, towards the possibility of remembering who we are and what we are here to do, and rekindling our communion with the enchanted sacred web of life. Rain particularly supports others amidst challenging and liberating passages down and through the underworld of psyche to reclaim soul qualities, presence, callings, power, and wisdom in greater service to our world. Rain is a Massachusetts born and has lived in Australia since the 90s. She is a mother to a surviving twin son and daughter and 17 transform transformative, sorry, <laughs> transformative years apart. I'm excited about her topic today, the pattern of soul journey and responding to the times we are in. And I was gonna let Rain actually introduce herself in her way um, today. Thank you, Ben. Um, so, uh, Spirit gave me a name that no one could pronounce, it's Saprina, and that, that has helped me to disidentify from my identity from the start. <laughs> um, in the Australian way of coming together in an important meeting, especially a sacred meeting like this, uh, it wouldn't feel right to not do what they do uh, in the indigenous way, which is to acknowledge country. Um, so I invite you to do that with me wherever you are on the globe, to just take a moment to acknowledge the country that we're on here where I am. It's Bunjalung Nation, um, home of indigenous people here um, that once flourished and passed through this area for a particular purpose. So perhaps you can feel under your own feet those stories and those lineages wherever you are and uh, in whatever way that patch of earth has been caretaken um, in the past. And this acknowledgement goes to not only past elders but those present with us and hopefully many generations in the future. Um, I want to acknowledge the ancestors um, that are here with us from land spirits to those in our bones, those who accompany us, especially at this time where things are pretty edgy on the planet and transformative. I want to acknowledge Pachamama and uh, Great Mystery. And whether we see Pachamama as writing her own story right now that all this um, chaos and assault to her, her body um, is part of her own dreaming, part of her own story, or whether we see that as something that is, is not inherently hers and whole, um, that we uh, must respond to from that side. I, I just want to acknowledge how much um, she is going through and her beings. I'm here in Australia, we have, as most people know, um, raging fires that are unprecedented and pushing many of our species to extinction quickly. Um, many um, lives severely altered and all of this really heating up the conversation about how do we live? Who are we in this great conversation? And what are we moving towards? Many people are reaching for ways in which to understand this. I'm going to um, talk about the um, soul journey amidst all of this and the underworld journey. So. Um, but my acknowledgement first is with Pachamama herself and the great mystery that uh, we can have faith in as a force of love and intelligence um, that enlivens us. So 
I um, finally want to acknowledge you, Ben, for this vision of bringing all these conversations to light, like little fires being tended throughout um, the globe. And those who are listening to each of these, coming to each of these fires, um, tending fires of their own. So um, I really acknowledge and applaud the fire keepers out there who are bringing forth their medicine and their purpose uh, in their own way. Hi guys, and I, I hope that my um, talk today in some way helps to empower that fire, make it burn bright. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the fire I keep in a moment, but just put it back to you, Ben. Is there anything you wanna to add to that? Um, that's, a, that's a hard one to um, talk over. That was beautiful. Thank you, Rain. And uh, Rain and I were actually talking before we started recording. If, um, we could introduce all talks um, through, you know, this indigenous lineage keeping and tending the fire. Um, and so that was um, just beautiful how you, uh, <laughs> how you welcome us all in. Um, and, um, and you're in, in the physical being a fire literally over there too. So I'm glad that rain's staying safe as well. It's uh, scary over there in Australia. And, um, and yeah, and, and, and we're just here to be in conversation with Rain today about just really just deep listening to the, the soul, how it whispers to us and how to hold space to the journey of soul, but also Rain's unique um, way of journeying with soul into um, you know, the underworld of the psyche through vision quests, um, through soul-oriented psychology and mentoring. Um, and it's almost like there's this, uh, Rain's created this bridge <laughs> in this um, in this world uh, through all that, and um, and it's just really, it really is beautiful. <laughs> um, and so, I guess just to go back a little bit, we can kind of come into these some of these terms that some of our um, maybe some of our listeners won't um, understand right now. Oh, most of our listeners might understand what some of these mean, but some might not. Um, and such as like soul oriented psychology. And so I wondered if you just wanted to expound a little bit on what you mean by soul oriented psychology. Mm. Mm. Um, so we have psychology, which um, we can mostly grasp what that is. And it is a, a, a tradition, a science-based tradition that has been um, brought into the medical model and, and, and scientific research. So. Um, often what gets practiced in psychology is that which is evidence-based um, quantitatively. And, um, and uh, there's been much to treasure, it's an amazing, an, an, um, a massive treasure in that research um, because it tells us so much about our, our neurology, our, um, the way our body works, the way our mind works at a physical level, how we interact with the environment our cognition, our emotions, so many of these mysteries are, are actually um, 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 in, informing um, how we understand the human psyche and therefore how we practice. As a psychologist, if I, uh, as, as rich as that is and informative and effective as that is, if I miss the whispering of the soul in a psychology session, then quite possibly I've missed um, an opportunity for an incredibly uh, transformative and developmental gateway that bring, switches on more lights for that person ultimately. So for example, um, language of, of symptoms such as depression and anxiety, if I'm putting on a traditional psychologist hat, I might think, okay, I've got six sessions, we need to reduce symptoms, we need to prove that to whatever authority or body or doctor that referred, uh, mostly to the person we need to in, um, provide some comfort in, in their life. But soul work isn't comfortable, <laughs> and soul work um, often has such an intelligence and such a force behind it that it might use depression or anxiety or incredible stress to give us a barometer to say, you need to tack and weave in a different direction. And that direction is um, what I'm tracking and weaving is their own tacking and weaving towards the direction of their soul-directed vision. So um, when depression arrives, in the scene or on the couch as it were, um, or virtually when I work with someone, uh, I give it a, a soul ear 
to listen to what is the deep longing within, within the conversation of depression, what is inherently out of balance, things like that. So, uh, you know, it goes on. But um, first and foremost, soul-based psychology to me means I'm not looking at someone with symptoms to reduce. I'm looking at someone who's on an incredible, mysterious journey that has power and mystery that I could not possibly, possibly um, interpret or, or come to understand, but to listen to um, and to bring like a quality of listening, a deep listening. So if I imagine this is the fire that I'm tending, um, someone's not coming to me as a patient or a client, they're coming as a, a, a journeyer out from the woods of their life and we sit at this fire together as though we're in the, the old practice of counsel. Um, I'm looking for the soul in their eyes and I, I'm looking for the ways in which their wholeness already exists and is looking to express more. You know, we, we come into th this world, so part of, part of this perspective is, um, is a philosophy, and I won't say this is how it is, but this is the philosophy that I really find useful and works in my bones, that we come into this world encoded with our wholeness and our soul um, already evident, and we are in touch with that, we're sensitized to it, but quickly adapt to a world that isn't so centric. And um, after thousands of years of, you know, we know the story, colonization, agriculture, institutionalization, all the, all the ways in which we now have this thing called westernized uh, condition. Um, well, that's kind of a treacherous place for someone, you know, sprouting through the ground of the earth to say, I'm here and how can I flourish? There's a lot to look after. So we adapt and we, we um, bring into parts of our psyche the parts that are going to do that job. Um, now, as we develop, that's a useful, um, uh, what Bill Plotkin calls the first house of belonging. And it's a necessary developmental task that we, um, you know, a arrive at some winning formulas. It might be a subpersonality uh, chorus that, of, of, of selves that we use to get us through a pleaser or a rebel or you know, that's, that's, a, that's a whole topic unto itself of how that works. Um, parts that are very good at protecting us and parts that are very good at alleviating the tension when it just gets too much. They're good at distracting us. They're good at, you know, um, making the, the, the consumer world that we're in even stronger. <laughs> All sorts of ways in which um, we can then become um, <clears throat> in the world of this adapted cluster of subpersonality, even our neurology starts to um, hum the tune of that after a while. So we can be located, you know, I kind of think of it as a location. But, and if we are from psychology, from a psychology point of view, if we're just working within that location, um, we might have missed the opportunity to help someone really um, let that first house of belonging mm. shatter if it needs to, or at least be chipped away whilst we're building the foundation for a soul-oriented life. Um, and what that is will be a surprise often to, definitely to me, but often to the person themselves. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not a prescription of how anyone needs to be or anything wrong with the first. Um, but this is what it means to bring a soul orientation to, to this field, to me. Through, through like, um, and just expound on your work, uh, to, through different, like transpersonal psychology and through depth psychology a little bit and um, using indigenous wisdom, which is like, and like you, were, you and I were talking earlier, is you're creating this bridge uh, where people can actually take that, to me, take that journey. Um, like uh, I'm just really inspired listening to you talk and um, this makes me think about all the amazingly smart people I know doing the same work, but uh, having trouble with that bridge connection and, mm -hmm. and like really want to applaud Rain for like actually really putting this work to, um, to application. And, um, and we're kind of talking earlier too about like that relevant bridge. Um, this kind of goes into another question. <laughs> I'm just uh, relating to you a little bit too. Um, and you said something that was to me, um, really inspiring it makes me more curious too um and that, that that soul journey 
is like an opportunity to bring the uh, crisis to um, to the surface. And as we see the crisis, you said that the soul journey agenda is to contribute to the Earth's story. Um, and so uh, this bringing people back to grounding and to the Earth. And and so, um, you know, that doesn't come to just, uh, you know, taking a course. <laughs> um, it, just takes, it just takes so much life experience. And so it kind of goes into another question, which was like, what, um, what have your experiences of like guiding others or personal experiences and what uh, fundamentals have you taken from that to really apply to your work? You kind of expound a little bit on psychology, but are there any other experiences or personal experiences that you really hold value to in that journey? Um, it, maybe we take a slice of that. Yeah, um, it's a heavy question. A slice <laughs> Can you give me a gateway into that question? What, what's the curiosity that you have there? Uh, I was just curious because um, you were talking, uh, and I, you and I were talking before um, the interview too, and then in, in your, in your, what you're just saying as well on um, that bridge and, and all your knowledge in the past. And so I was just wondering if there's any other um, life experience or what experience you've gone from guiding others that you see it as fundamental in helping people answer the call to the soul. Yeah, okay. So this is, um, that's like open license to take this anywhere. That's so huge. <laughs> um, I, uh, um, maybe I'll just talk a little bit about my own experience first. So um, one thing that helped me to create that bridge. So. Um, um, I, I, like many people, heard heard the call at some point in life, and and for me, I can I can trace it back to teenage years, and then started to gather around the age of twenty one. That's you know when I did a lot of the what we call leaving home. Um, you leave the world behind that you knew. You 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 shed your former identity in a bigger way. You allow yourself to to go into kind of a, a many uh, layer by layer dying experience. Um, coincidences start to pop through. There's just this undeniable tug that you need to go in this direction. For me, that direction was Australia. Um, and the story kind of began from there. Eventually, um, I mean, my, my, my career was always quite clear that I wanted to be in service to the earth. If it wasn't through the sciences of biology and that sort of thing, it was going to be in service to the human psyche in relation to the earth. So that was, that was already a bridge somehow that was in there. Um, and um, I was humming along in my career of transpersonal coaching and counseling. And um, Vision Quest was a whisper somewhere back there and I really came to it after I'd hit a point of crisis in my life where um, I, I was expecting twins, identical twin boys. The world as I knew it at that time was you give birth to them and then you, you, know, you look forward to each, each Mother's Day, Father's Day, Christmas, birthday, and all the, all the markers that, that we, we, we expect. And um, in the process of labor, the, the doctor said, I think twin two is dead. And the world at that point that I knew crashed. This is 18 years ago now. Um, and my surviving twin um, was on life support. And mm -hmm. when I woke up from that experience, from the general um, anesthetic of the emergency, um, there, were, there were no babies in my hands or, or th that, ex that, that story opened up a well of grief. It also, in hindsight, gave me direct access to um, um, the sacred, the sacred dimension of our world, and and feeling really sharply all that was desacralized, all that wasn't sacred any longer, and make, relating to this earth in a way that is sacred is um, the business of many of these sacred earth ceremonies. So. I, um, after that experience, um, due to the, the grief that I was experiencing and the, 
unraveling of, of my psyche and of my life in many ways. Um, Vision Quest was something that, a bit back to front, I was asked to support, but I also needed to do it myself and came to that as a, um, a portal again and again, I've quested many times, but that, that was the place in which I could hear the deepest conversation that no psychologist or mentor or coach or even respected elder could, could really help me access in the way that the quest could. So um, um, I came to have a full understanding of its power and, and place in, in why it's gifted to, to, to humanity. Um, and, but the bridge going the other way, I can see many people, you know, coming to a quest, not because their lives have fallen apart necessarily, but because they, they feel a stirring, a longing, a, even just the longing to be rolling around in an intimate way with the earth's body and to feel no, to, to feel the true belonging of, of sinking back into the earth, to have that depth of nature connection. Um, and people come to quest for many reasons, many callings. There's always a strong and powerful need when it arrives. But what I have seen over the years is that um, they, they might be a bit hard on themselves, perhaps, the quester, if they expect that the quest is going to be the thing that's going to, um, uh, it, I mean, it does in a way like no other, like it's a sledgehammer and it's a very, very quick way to grow up and it's a very, very quick way to get clear. And it's a very, for, for the amount of uh, hours we invest in it, 96 or something, um, in, in the actual ceremony, I know of nothing else as strong. And even with that, I can see that the psychology of a person could, could do well with a, prepar a good preparation phase and a good integration phase to take that and, um, and help catch up the rest of the psyche that doesn't know what to do with all this power and clarity. And, and you know, I know now I need to walk in that direction, but what do I do with all this? And how do I, how do I um, bring the rest of me into alignment? And that, that can be, that in and of itself can be also um, a treacherous path when it comes to um, the ways in which we belong to the world. So yeah, those are just some ways in which I've, I've seen the bridge between sacred ceremony and, and putting on the other hat of supporting people individually with the, the, their personal, um, not just the longing, but the, the tension and what's really difficult. Mm. Yeah. Rainy, if, if, uh, if I start to. <laughs> no, it's, I, I'm in, just enjoying listening to you talk. I'm sure our viewers and our listeners are too. And what a beautiful story to, um, and to come into this work. Um, that's kind of why I was trying to leave that into, um, is like, you know, we all have our own story and we're just presenting this back to our community and taking, you know, taking this knowledge as we go and, um, and it can't just be done. And I like, like what you say, it's a sledgehammer. Um, you know, you're not going to find out everything in this one event. It's a process with these, with this quest and with this work and in, in life. Um, yeah. And, and and, and this and not really reining you in, but like, yeah, we could have gone down that rabbit hole for a, a whole hour. Um, <laughs> that's a heavy question. Um, and I guess I, I had another question too, um, Rain, um, is like, uh, you, you kind of hinted to it a little bit, if you want to expand on a little bit more, um, like how, your journey on oriented, oriented to life and how you've become able to serve your gift as a soul's calling. Um, mm -hmm is you know it's, it's something we don't really most humans don't fall it ever really tr truly and fully fall into <laughs> um and like and when we do it's like much later in life um and so kind of coming back to the introduction or, or the beginning of our talk when we're talking about the whispering of the soul and kind of hinted to that earlier talking like helping people really listen and find um not really find the answer, but finding how to actually hear that whisper. Mm. And so uh, I just want to know if you want to, just curious if you wanted to expound on that a little bit and just talk about like what's, what's fundamental, but also like not really what's needed, but like what, how do we need to um, 
I guess, use our life skills and use our current knowledge that we already have to learn how to really listen to that whisper? Mm. Yeah, it's a great question. It's one I'm still, still, um, still learning about and, and curious to know more. I think if I'd listened to my soul from the outset many times, I could have saved myself a lot of hassle. Um, not that it's an easy path, but, um, uh, um, well, you know, the, the soul, I think, whispers to us in ways that can confront the status quo, how, how, what we find comfortable, what we're used to, what is secure, what we like to partake in the distractions of, um, I, my understanding of the soul, my experience and feeling of it is that it is encoded with like a DNA and knows its evolutionary potential and that evolutionary push will come through. Um, now how we, how we hear that and listen to that. And even if we do know, like it's, so someone say who's soul initiated in, in at least in the, in the way that some people use that term, that's a person who, um, may already be quite conscious and clear about how who they are at a, at a deep mythopoetic level um, they know their purpose they know when they are using their gifts that their soul qualities are, are clear to them and it's as though the the ego is in service to that and the personality sort of rearranges a bit to take the shape of that mm -hmm. that um, instead of the adaptation we had earlier in life it's it's taken the shape of the soul um, to do its work with the outer world. But even then, the question is, how do we continue to follow its compass? And um, Stalking Wolf in, in that lineage that Tom Brown um, um, uh, has done a wonderful job of, of teaching so many through that, um, talks about this, this it's, a, it's actually a feeling in the body and it's a feeling just kind of around about the solar plexus area that, that tightens when we're off course and there's a release when there's a knowing that, okay, the soul is speaking now, there's a knowing that's coming through now. So I think um, one arc of the question is that there's a, there's a kind of process of becoming more and more um, embodied in our soul qualities and the way in which it can serve in the world um, ways of knowing that we might be off track or when the life kind of ooh, runs out of things, um, things become pointless, they become hard, they become in service to an, an old agreement, even something that seemed like it was really on track, like, you know, working with um, one of the people I, I work with who comes to mind, um, there's nothing really out of alignment with her life. She um, has a modality that really reflects her nature that you could you could she kind of did a first Passover of, of that version of her life and said I'm on track I'm living my soul's path but as we've gotten deeper into it what her soul began to cry for was I'm if I keep that story going I'm actually interrupting the deeper conversation that mystery wants to have with me and the more I book my calendar for the next retreat and the next event and beholden to that the, the less I'm I'm allowing myself to be in the raw um, steering in the ways my soul wants to and in ways that could surprise me and in ways that make sense down the track. So uh, again, another, another juicy topic. Um, yeah, yeah. And I, I liked how you related that to uh, Tom Brown um, and, and that lineage of Stalking Wolf. Um, I remember I think years ago, I re reading about that and really understanding what that pull, like how the pull is physical <laughs> and always thinking that, you know, that pull is, you know, spiritual and he relates that to the body. It kind of reminds me of like a, um, a quote, one of my mentors and teachers who um, brought me into this work actually would say, he's like, soul is, is all, I always kind of laughed at it because I never knew what it meant for a long time. And um, that, Tom Brown kind of brought that to the surface. Um, he, was, he would always say, like, a soul is never um, seen or felt or heard. It just is. 
<laughs> and I would always be like, what in the world does he mean? But like, he's just saying, like, you know, it's a state of being and it's a state of this transpersonal state that we're, we're in. And then we feel that pull. Um, and then, and yeah, just that could be a whole other, uh, like we we're saying earlier, like a whole other rabbit hole <clears throat> on the, on the soul topic. Um, and I'm sure a lot of, uh, the viewers and the listeners are also kind of warm, um, wondering like, you know, are, are they themselves, um, following that call, that call to the soul and like how do they know where it's coming from? And, you know, it's a journey within all of us. Um, but I did want to, um, I guess expound a little bit too on, um, how, I guess, um, when we're answering the call to soul and hearing the whisper and we're finally, you know, in life, wherever we are in life, finding what that purpose and what we're doing. Um, and then know if you wanted to expound a little bit on like when our, when we're introducing our purpose, our gifts, like, you know, the gifts that we're born to do <clears throat> and we know, like truly know what we're supposed to be, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, presenting into this world. Um, and just didn't know if you want to expound on when that happens. Um, how do we communicate that with our uh, community? Like, I guess you could, I don't know if you want to use any examples in your vision quest or like in corporation. Maybe we can jump into a corporation a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like, so how does like transpersonal psychology and uh, vision quest work? bridge together to help incorporate to so that so we're kind of moving to the stage where um i suppose preceding the stage um that that a person could travel a long time really not knowing and be being worked by the question being in that kind of angst of the search um and if that happens to be where anybody is um i, I just want to offer you due respect for the, the process itself of that um of that angst and of the of the seeking and 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 to be oh i guess um noticing how that is actually changing something in the ground of who you are through that through that experience so if you are fortunate enough and if this world is fortunate enough enough around you that that gift is ready to um to be shared um um, well, we don't know what that before and after picture could look like, but I have seen that they, they can be very different. You know, that the example of someone who's um, built a life around being a provider for, the, for a family and those, you know, in that family are, are dependent and the way in which that person knows how to provide is through something really predictable and secure. And that's, I guess that's what would be called the survival dance, you know, not, not to not to jeopardize the other values and in in those who you love and, and, and to walk a path that's sacred in, in, a, in a 360 degree way. And yet, it, even though that function may be, may be served in a way that feels out of alignment, may even be really well past its due date, there's this movement to um, bringing the survival dance into the sacred dance of, of now, how, 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 can I, how can I bring my idea onto the ground. And some people do take a period of, of great economic sacrifice. Some people take a period of um, withstanding criticism, judgment, um, the, what were the, the threshold guardians at the, at, at the first threshold that say, no, don't go. We are too invested in you being in, in the old version. Um, they may, you know, come back to test us. Um, but if you have the fortitude and you're, you're, you're going through that gap, um, 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 there, there could be, I wouldn't say luxury, but there could be time enough to risk what it would be like to test out having your purpose um, move into the world of sacred, sacred economics or, or where your gift is actually received in a kind of um, reciprocal way. Um, um, and sometimes the process is just, you know, by degrees, by degrees, getting closer, getting closer, getting closer, getting ever more closer, not this big, I was in corporate and now I'm a healer. You know, it, it, it could be um, a concept by concept. So, um, 
uh, I suppose, um, again, anybody vision questing, <laughs> just to be gentle that it's not a dramatic before and after picture, it, it is in terms of your psyche and how you see the world and how you see yourself. But for the outer world to kind of, uh, you know, turn the, turn the ship around to, to come into full alignment can take a process. And actually we have some questers that will do quite extensive mentoring after that or come back to quest a few times after that as well because in each of those, in each, you know, after the first quest where they may get clear, the ones that follow are about the power, um, you know, be becoming the vehicle for the power to flow through them to enact that on the ground. Hmm. So a bit of human help, a bit of, a bit of spirit help and, and total willingness to keep, keep tacking and weaving. Hmm. Yeah, beautiful. No, very well said. Very well said. I like your um, tacking and weaving metaphor. It makes a lot of sense in my, my head too. And uh, your ending piece about the quest and like how it has to do no, with the human psyche and like what that actually goes through. Uh, I don't want to steal his thunder. He's also another speaker on the summit. So he might mention it, but he, uh, uh, Carter Brown, uh, one of the other speakers on the summit, will, uh, get, uh, I've heard him mention um, that when you, when you come away from a quest, he tells the story of, uh, right before you go away, of the sacred deer meat. And I'm not going to tell the story because he might tell it in his talk. <laughs> but that idea of like, when you go away from a quest, you're, you're different. Your psyche is different. You, you might not feel anything, but you're, you're different. And people are going to see you differently. So when you, yeah. when you try to share everything immediately um, and you don't share it from the heart or you don't share it from the soul, people are going to be really scared. <laughs> they might see you differently. So don't try to share everything because you're just going to they're going to be like, okay. Or they'll kind of be really scared of you. Um, and yeah, that's just so important. Like um, it could be a question too, and, or something we can both expound on. But um, yeah, like when we are falling into our gifts and our purpose, um, we're always asking that question. Like, okay, well, how do I share this to? And who do I share this to? You know, it's such a, common question that I, I even I see in my work um so it's more it's like the how but also it's um you know like the when or like who do I talk to um and really it's just like what's to me it's what kind of what state of being do we need to be in before we produce our gifts like because you know our gifts are always in us we just need to be in a certain state to do that like you're kind of saying um yeah so it's, it's so that's a, and that's a pretty heavy question. We uh, kind of unloaded some pretty heavy questions for you. <laughs> and you've done such a good job expounding on those. Um, but did I, did I miss anything in that summary that you were kind of touching there's, on? There's a lot in that. I mean, what, yeah, one thing is the state of being and how precious that is and what supports it, what um, undermines it, or, you know, like a little little rabbit coming out of a hole. Oh, just beautiful in rabbitness just gets freaked out and goes back in so how do we support it to bound out there um anyway th there's there's the state of being that um you're talking about and also this this graduated shift into how do i live it on the ground so i'd say they're kind of like two different things and um in, in terms of the state of being you know vision quest and in, in even can be accessed in in one of these sacred fire meetings we're talking about or your own just half hour in nature you know just washing it off at the beach and coming back like oh here i am we get these oh i'm home moments oh here i am and they often happen um through nature um and through safely held spaces now that might be within a human context or actually not not around humans but somehow we access this state and we hope because this is a, a, a hit, you know, this is um, a peak at, or the soul's peak through us. This is who I am. This is my home base now. Can, can I live this? But we, there's a question of how to stabilize that. Hmm. Where, and I think your questions in and of themselves are perfect and relevant because when we do do so, we could be, um, if we kind of take that analogy of the first house of belonging and then what happens after that. So the first house of belonging is about finding our winning formulas in the world 
in a world that has become um, over adapted to things that are frankly quite traumatized or distorted and we're doing our best to to hang on in there and, and find um, um, a way of engaging in that world. So we might come out of one of these um, expanded state experiences or deep homecoming kinds of experiences and then meet the world of people in mass in their first house of belonging, which is an adaptive game. Um, and when we come with our light, it can be illuminating and inspiring, and it can also be threatening. And um, so that's, that's up to the individual to risk that. Um, I often recommend out of a quest though, that we, we really do hold it close and we might arrange to clear what we can of our diary. And we meet with people that can really meet at a heart level that are more likely to meet us, not throw us back into our head or back into a subpersonality too quickly until we've got the, um, a little bit more marination time in, in our soul qualities. And, you know, and down the track, we, what's happening here is that we, we're making a whole life that is reinforcing of those soul qualities. So in time, you know, those who we are in partnership with, well, I've, I've repartnered, you know, no, actually, like, let's not even go there. That nothing to do with him. But, you know, <laughs> I, I was at a stage of development where I couldn't hold the two. You know, I really couldn't hold, um, well, you married this adapted person, but now there's also this person, you know, and I, a more developed version of me could, could negotiate that. But who I was at the time was in this kind of dilemma. Um, but Nonetheless, we can um, bit by bit have our life, you know, reflect um, that in our work as well as in our re relational field, as well as in the way in which we, we choose to live. Um, and I guess, you know, Bill Plotkin talks a lot about when we he come, when we, people come out of the programs at Animus Valley Institute, whether it's a, a quest or a soul craft or, or any of the others, um, that there's this time of ETCs, experimental threshold crossings. So we've just gone from the world we knew into the underworld of, um, of deeper access of, of what lies in wait, the, the hidden stories, be it our soul qualities or our unfinished business. Um, and then we recross the threshold, we return to the world we knew. So that's, that's, a, you know, that's the template, that's what's happening. And each time we cross, but he's also talking not just in a, uh, event, but as a stage, an actual phase by phase stage. And after people have kind of hit the, 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 the bottom of the U of the descent and, and, and they're really in contact with who they are at a soul level and their center of gravity has shifted into it from where it was before. Now there's this movement back up to the world um, and the living out of it that you, you point out. So we've got that ascent still in the underworld, still kind of held by those who get it there perhaps, um, and that which can reinforce it. But we can start to experiment bit by bit by bit by bit by bit, you know, someone who wants to do a career change that's more reflective of, of what they accessed in that underworld might start off by giving a keynote speech to whoever will listen, you know, just to, just to practice. And then, then um, they might um, change something about their, their social routine. Someone who's um, into fitness and running on the beach might uh, put down their iPad and stop counting steps and whatever and just feel what it's like to move, just move as the soul would have them do in a way that might surprise them. So these little ways can drip into our lives as we, as we shift into that center of gravity. Mm. Wow, yeah. Beautiful once again. <laughs> and um, I'll, these references to Bill Pock and if our viewers and um, watchers are familiar with Bill, I'm sure a lot of you are. Um, yeah, you go check out his work and as well. He's um, the underworld journey, as we would always <laughs> call that journey, um, what you're saying. And I studied from one of his pupils um, for a while, um, Jonathan Gustin, uh, Purpose Guides Institute. And and uh, at one point, I loved, I loved his twist on like the journey out. Um, Jonathan would say, um, 
you know, go out and, you know, find those people who are there to listen without judgment. Like you were saying, like people here that are listening to you, they won't be scared, but people who are listening without judgment and are just listening, they won't say anything back. And like, mm-hmm. if you think about that, like who in your life will actually do that? That's not your husband or a wife. Um, of course not your kids. Your kids will think you're crazy um, or best friend. And so like, that's, you know, our society, um, I would think that, I mean, I want to call, call it an epidemic but it definitely can it is one i think but um you know it can have a negative word and so jonathan would call this like journey your your soul circle which i just love that like this circle of you know people who really know you as your soul and like that's and that's the way it's going to be lifted you know and leveraged in your community um and, and, you know, it's, all this work sounds so profound and so brand new, but we used to all do this. Our ancestors <laughs> and our indigenous customs, you know, we're all doing this um, this work. And so, yeah, and we're getting to the top of the hour here, and we could talk a whole other um, journey um, as well. And so I, I don't want to um, ask a too low of a, <laughs> of a question because Rain and I have been getting really deep. Um, but... I guess um, if you wanted to kind of top off the hour here, um, Rain, you, you really expound a lot on your, your work. And um, I'm sure the listeners and viewers are really uh, pretty familiar with that, getting familiar with that now. But I just want to leave the rest up to you to see if you want to like, add anything in for the next yeah. 15 minutes or so. All right. Well, I, I do. I, I thank you. Um, what's coming is this what um what it looks like through my eyes right now in terms of the link between individual soul work and the time it is on the planet um Mm -hmm. and the opportunity that we have to in uh, re-enchant this world re-sacralize this world and rewild this world that's what i'd like to see i mean part of me kind of goes really big with the question and go do we just surrender? I think a lot of people are asking, how do we be with this? I think they're asking, what is my part in this? How do I, have we to reach the tipping point? Is there still time to turn the tide? Um, really, what is the point in even doing my soul journey anymore? Um, should I just be in full thrown activism on the biggest scale that I can do with my resources and gifts the best I know them with what I've got forget about the soul journey just take me where I am and how do I be and then a lot of people aren't in that space at all but um I'm trying to gonna I'm, regardless of where we might be with that question and what we're observing and how we are with it um I feel that and not and regardless of how we see what mama earth herself has to say about it who knows I don't know However, the soul journey is a pattern of experience that can teach us a lot about how we can move with these times. And I would argue that even if it's not to save the world, it's to belong more deeply to the world. And you know, with the focus that you've taken, Ben, on re- re- enlivening community, um, even at that level because it's a global community and it's fractal the the world the the world that we immediately touch um we can belong to all the more and live out that aspect of gaia's story so um it's a big topic again but what we know about the soul what we can see in the in the pattern of soul initiation is this uh movement from that first house of belonging that the what we might in an ego-based society anyway more ego-based center of gravity and the calling comes, we find our way across the threshold. We've left what um, Bill calls the, the middle world, which is the everyday world. And it's the world where we kind of, you know, give it our best shot at adapting to the culture that we've got um, with its gaping holes and elder, eldering and all that. But, you know, that's, that's where we are. It's running amok. It's chewing up the resources, doing its thing. Um, we have the upper world that's an option where we can sit in the transcendent beauty of it all um merge with it um but the underworld journey is one of a a full participation you know it's 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 an embodied participation with the grit 
and with the dark and with the local. And Australia, in the, in the main paper the other day, said Australia is the canary in the coal mine. You know, what we're experiencing here is, is not just of this continent. We are, it's a very sensitive ecology and it's really hitting, um, it, it, things are amplified here in such a way that it gives us time to say, okay, well, how, as a soul being, do I be with the, the old story ending of who I thought I was and what we thought this world was about, what we, and what is the dreaming for the new? So um, that's the conversation where my mentoring clients are going now. It, it, it's kind of past the me project and how do I have my own experience of being the best I can be and being on my purpose and being in, you know, enchanted dialogue with the world. That's, that's great. And that, but it's gone bigger. So um, I want to suggest the art of surrender, that we surrender, uh, get really comfortable with the art of surrender um, to who we really are, as well as surrender of the middle world story that is damaging. Um, borrowing that, that phrase from Bill, the surrender to and the surrender of, of this, of this stage. So to put all that together, I'm just wildly proposing, what if globally we can all, if we haven't already moved into stage four, and if we are anywhere near developmentally ready in terms of the actual years we've been on the planet, anywhere after adolescence, let's just go for it. Throw <laughs> 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 ourselves into the um, caterpillar soup of what's next, you know, and, and really let go of um what just the bits that haven't worked so a lot of courage might be required right now but there's an intelligence at play and to have faith in that what a wow what an amazing proposal i think that i'm i'm definitely in on that proposal i'll i'll sign it <laughs> um that was just so wonderful um i don't know if you're Remember what you just said, if you can rephrase what you're saying before the mentoring, what you get your, what you're working on with your mentoring clients and beyond, like that quote you just mentioned was so touching to me. Yeah. Um, well, I'm not sure who, where the meme came from originally. Um, I heard it through Catherine In Ingram's work. Um, uh, and she makes reference to the me project, you know, the, 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 the times of, um, of just wanting to be our best. That's great. <laughs> but, and, and the soul's impulse actually is for that, yes, evolutionarily speaking, and with the qualities that we have on board, the powers that we're given. It's just that that's not the point. It's, it, the, the, the point is to um, lock and load with those for deep belonging in this planet, whether it's to make sacred that little worm that we're in communion with <laughs> as small as it is through to the power that could actually have in the quantum field for hope you know if, if people have hope mm -hmm. so um that's that and that's where the mentoring conversations are going is yes i'm, I'm in this soul journey yes i'm giving it all i've got this deep self-inquiry but it's not about my inner world it's really about the world so yeah yeah um that this is, is really touching. I hope a lot of people will resonate with that. I was actually, it was kind of right before our call, I was with a client and helping them realize that, you know, it's hard, it's, but it's not about you. And the last given for the community. And That's a right. little message from the fire itself that I got um, when I was in at Vision Quest last time, we were, it was the night before the questions were going out. We had ceremony, the fire was still going and I was with it and had a very somatic experience. It was very, very painful, but whatever. What, what, what tumbled out of it was a, a message uh, as though the fire was speaking directly and said, the time for self-doubt is over. It's, it, it's, it, use what you've got, wherever you're at, like wherever you're at on the developmental journey, wherever you're at in the clarity process, just use what you've got. Um, not in an ego aggrandized way, that's different, but um, 
offer it to the world now. So. And what and what great advice. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, there's just yeah, you know, I just told the questions, guys. I, just just do it. Just go. Like you can scale up on the way. You know, we can mature on the way. God hope we do. But go. Go, go, go. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of, it was kind of funny. That was my next question is what advice would you give um, the listeners and viewers today? And maybe that could be the same advice. <laughs> yeah, I think so. And nature, sitting in nature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and the, I guess the last piece is that, you know, I was really blessed during the time I was going through the, the depth of, of the darkness and dark night of the soul and, and all the disintegration that happened there that I did have a therapist who I would absolutely say was an elder who held what my experience in the context of a soul journey. Had I not had that, it would have been held in a way that would have been a missed opportunity. So my advice is unplug from the distractions, the synthetic world, the consumer world, the institutionalized world as best we can, you know, as best we can. Sit in nature, sit in the original law of things. Um, and if you're going to engage in some human help, you know, someone who is working in a soul-based way that, that can really help you put into perspective this upper world, middle world, underworld, how they work together and the importance of, of ceremony in nature, perhaps. You know? Yeah. And go for a yummy, yummy run on the beach if that's <laughs> rather than power. I don't know. Things like that. You know, if you follow your longing and bliss and all those good advices that we've been given along the way, you know, they, they're, they're information, they're information, guiding information. Mm. Mm. That's, I want to go around the beach now, even though it's about five hours away. <laughs> um, well, Ray, I, I just really appreciate your, your wisdom and your knowledge that you brought today. And also that advice is, this really touching. Appreciate that very much. Um, and wow, that good timing. We're like right at the top of um, the hour here. Um, and uh, yeah, if I asked you another question, you and I would go down something else. Um, but I'm sure the listeners and the viewers would definitely want to watch, but I don't want to go too far over. Um, but I just want to thank you for today. And thank you so much for uh, speaking from the heart and from the soul. I really appreciate that. And I just want to send blessings and thanks your way. So thank you so much. <laughs> and have oh, the boys are laughing with us. <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> it's quiet here. Um, <laughs> but yes, yeah, so thank you and have a great rest of your day and be safe in the, the fires out there. Thanks, Ben. All of you take care too. Take care. Bye.